Cool, and welcome to this uh, this session. So, I have over the last months or so uh, been reading uh, Ninus uh, ideas about how to create uh, DevOps in uh, SAP cloud integration world, and it's been interesting to follow what he has been creating. So, I'm really excited to have Ninu here. Ninu, could you introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, Daniel. First of all, I would like to thank you for this chance to meet you. Uh, uh, you're one of the most influential persons in the SAP integration area and being able to uh, have this informal conversation on a common shared interest, which is this DevOps area. Um, yeah, uh, starting now by introducing myself. So hi everyone, I'm Nuno, I'm from Portugal. I work with uh, software development for almost 20 years now, either leading teams or um, in an informal or formal way, or as a developer myself. And uh, I joined Faring in 2021 uh, to really start working on uh, cloud integration in a, a very professional way, I would say, in a very complex way. Um, and uh, I joined Faring with the interest to um, help the, to establish the SAP integration suite as the main integration platform for, for the company. So since the beginning, I knew the rules of the game. So I, I knew that we would have like hundreds or thousands of interfaces in the future. It was planned basically. Uh, so yeah, I had in mind that we needed to have some governance, some common tools, just a kind of a framework. Um, so uh, that uh, made me do some research on the web. Uh, also found some blogs from Axel, uh, which was a very um, known person also on the integration uh, space. And I started to explore this DevOps uh, area as a proof of concept on my spare time together with a colleague. And in about two or three months, we already have some very good convincing ideas to present it to, to the management. So I believe this is not some easily digestible topic for the management. So once you present it, you should bring some value uh, in a very clear way, let's say. Yeah, because um, I yeah. guess that's the question. So. You had like a prototype. What's why would management buy into a DevOps process? Because we as developers love all the cool shiny stuff, but management exactly. is more like a lot of places. We want yeah five I, more integrations. Please do that instead of focusing on all this strange stuff. Exactly. So uh, first of all, let me say that I think this DevOps topic uh, on integration is not doesn't make sense for all, all companies. So uh, I've worked with some very different companies in the past using cloud integration, and some of them on one spectrum, um, uh, we have teams with functional people that just imported uh, standard integration packages and configured them and deploy them. So with very less technical uh, knowledge. Um, on the other side, we, we now on Faring have such a complex scenarios and uh, a lot of integrations that uh, we really think it makes sense to, to do this kind of stuff. But I, I believe most of the companies are somewhere in the middle where they have like, I don't know, three to four uh, developers, a small team of developers importing stuff, uh, uh, standard uh, integration packages, while also uh, performing some developments as well. Uh, and, and for those, uh, I mean, I, I still see value on this, but more in a usable way, not really creating it from scratch as we did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think as soon as uh, you start to grow your code base, uh, this governance, is in my eyes really mandatory to to avoid future issues. Uh, so this is really the way I see it. Now, so, so the 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 invest or the it's not like you have like a pressing issue. You have five hundred integration that fails or anything like that. It is more like if we need to be able to continuously deliver this, we need to plant the seeds now to have the process in place. So we can have this later 
Exactly. So it's all about uh, planning the process of development, planning the support, planning uh, how the the guidelines should be followed by by every developer. So uh, we have a, a yeah a considerable size uh, team already, and they work on uh, yeah across the globe basically. So we don't run on the same time zones. So that's also an important factor why the guidelines is also so important. Uh -huh. But uh, answering a bit or coming a, again into the management involved, uh, how to convince the, the management to, to buy in this, this idea, basically. Uh, and uh, on our case, the management was not involved since the beginning. So uh, we had no idea where this POC could get us. So it started like a playground and uh, exploration kind of <laughs> stuff. Uh, uh, but only after uh, we already had been uh, creating backups uh, in place for source code and binaries, uh, these automatic synchronization, the CPI lint. So we have some uh, ground already to show to, to the management. Um, so my manager really enjoyed the idea and proposed us to add like one user story per sprint on these DevOps topics. And I think it's very reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, we need to understand that DevOps is not the core of our business. It's just some side topic, but it's also valuable. Um, so one user story per sprint sounds like a, a good agreement and a good commitment for both parts. Mm -hmm. So you get to improve something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so put, how long time have you been working on this? Uh, so this uh, initial pump, let's say, it was like two or three months on our spare time. But uh, nowadays it's like, I don't know, uh, maybe half a day uh, on a two weeks uh, sprint okay. basis. So it's really minor, I would say. Um, because it's also self-governed uh, at this point, self-sustained. Um, so we don't, we just use it to change uh, or to increment value, but not really, we don't lose a lot of time on maintainability of, of it. Yeah, okay. So I guess then that then brings to the next one. So how is this mm -hmm. accepted into the organization? Do we, and, and I guess you also have a lot of... Uh, whatever freelance uh, external contractors uh, working with with you on some of these things are they able to understand and use the tools yes uh, so basically we have a regular one-on-ones with our internals and externals and these are really general discussions about what they think that we can improve like as a company as a process as a on the development so it's it's not really focus on on this jenkins area but more uh, broader and uh, yeah one consistent feedback that we get from um, every developer is that they never work in an environment so well organized with so much automation and all the steps being clear so i think we got very good feedback without even asking it so I think it it it's really nice. Cool. And I guess this makes it easier also somehow to attract talent that you actually have, and maybe actually that is the business case. We actually focus on improving the the, the way you're delivering. So it's not just file import export or whatever you are, yes. you're doing and we have a yeah. process in place. Yeah, it, it, it's very important because, as you mentioned, we have some externals and there's some rotation, which is normal in this area. Um, so it's very easy to onboard a new person. We also have guys for that uh, and uh, make uh, them familiar with uh, with this process that we are following. So yep. I think it's, it's really enjoyable. So the... The basis of all of this is built on a number of Dinkin pipelines, as I read from, from the blog, that you can exactly. trigger and some runs nightly to to update and back up uh, the scenarios. Did you experience with Dinkins before and how is it to work with these kind mm -hmm. of pipelines? Yeah, so uh, I've been working with Java since 2004, so I'm quite uh, familiar with it by now. <laughs> 
Uh, with Jenkins, I've worked in the past on a project for SAP in Germany, um, and uh, that's where I got most of my experience with it. And uh, yeah, it was very smooth to start working on it. I knew already most of of the concepts, so that helped us mm -hmm. to to ramp up and show some meaningful value already uh, yep. very fast. Okay. So how many pipelines do you have? Uh, so uh, as you might have read from the blog, we have uh, uh, pipelines that are synchronized uh, depending on the number of packages you have. So this happens like in an automated fashion. It creates a pipeline per CPI package. We have around 100 and so. So we have at least those numbers of generated pipelines then. On top of that, we have what we call like admin pipelines, which is really, yeah, all the other value that we bring. So uh, even to trigger a pipeline that will synchronize all these 100 packages, this is an admin pipeline that we have for that. And for these uh, pipelines, uh, we are talking about 2025, I would say. Okay. I guess a lot of times when you're talking about uh, DevOps, you talk about uh, merging, uh, mm -hmm. Git merge, and people would be using that as approach to figure out what needs to go into uh, the, the yeah. new branches and new, new systems. And I think this is what a lot of customers think, hey, this is what we want. I definitely see some, some challenges with having that approach and say, okay, the Git is our master please update it and merge and create all of these different yeah. things yeah. what's your take uh, on that yeah let me start by saying that uh, we um, started to create such complex devops tool because the standard native uh, git integration was not in place you know because that would be like a, a game changer for us and i think for a lot of persons in the community as well because uh yeah, if you don't have that in mind, it doesn't make much sense to to really have a dual synchronization, like synchronize, synchronizing from uh, cloud integration to Git and then from Git into cloud integration again, because uh, you will have to solve uh, some additional challenges, such as locking, uh, solving conflicts. You will lose your single source of truth. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of, uh, additional issues that come from that approach. So we don't see um, it much valuable. The way I see is really SAP embedded uh, Git integration from scratch into the tool. I think this makes a whole a lot of sense. Where the the figure or <laughs> sorry, figure up, obviously we 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 have run into the same kind of problems that you have your. Uh, your uh, iFlows in the web ID and you have your source code uh, for Groovy scripts, et cetera, and you need somehow to figure out to to synchronize this. We have added some some Gradle scripts that allow you to push from from the Git, but we would never also have this kind of merge because I don't know. I don't know. At least 50% of the works go into the web ID, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And then you have a smaller part creating a few Groovy scripts, etc., uh, as a separate one. Yeah, but uh, I I really think uh, an offline uh, idea tool to 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 code is really desired by the community and seen like a standard nowadays in product development. So you have uh, I don't know um, debug uh, capabilities there. You, you could have this Git integration. And I'm thinking a tool like Eclipse or uh, any other similar We use uh, IntelliJ. Visual, and... IntelliJ or yeah. Visual Studio Code or whatever. Uh, just think the, the community would really enjoy to have uh, an offline development tool with the possibility to synchronize into, into Git and then having CPI to read uh, from Git and having Git as a single source of truth, some, something like this. But I think it's really a must uh, and you see it everywhere. So uh, WebID, 
business application studio. So all developer tools nowadays have this Git native Git integration, yep. and uh, cloud integration is somehow the exception. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you, in most cases you would have the people working in the creating Groovy script in the, the web IDE. Then you have the people using uh, uh, Groovy IDE, uh, mm -hmm. the, the web app. And then the last one would be using IntelliJ Eclipse or whatever in a Git repository to do this. In our way of doing this, we yeah also synchronize to a Git repository at uh, there's Groovy scripts, and then you, you in, in Eclipse can allow you to, to run and debug it. And it is definitely one of the more challenging things to get to, to be able to run these things. But I guess once you're there, it just makes things uh, so much easier that you can get started with. Yeah. Uh, on that note, uh, for testing especially, uh, we um, nowadays create the... Um, the Groovy scripts for testing for unit tests uh, directly on Eclipse to save us some time and to allow us to debug a few stuff. Yeah. Uh, but for that, you will need the jars from your tenant. And there yeah. are funny ways and creative ways to get those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen some, some of these. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> we, yeah. Yeah, so I guess that would be the only thing that a developer would commit as these uh, test cases because that's what makes sense there. Mm -hmm. um, then on top of this, the merging, as a read your blog, you are not using uh, the Git as a as transport, but cloud integration, uh, SAP cloud transport management, right? Exactly. So all the transports. Yes, so a CTMS is really our um, tool, a selected tool uh, to do the transports, which is because it's easier to set up. It's not very costly. Uh, if I would start again from scratch, we would probably go with CTS plus, um, because we also have transports on the ABAP side ah, and okay. it would be interesting to, um, yeah, to club them together and even link them to solution manager, um, and job, I guess. In charm, exactly. Uh, but uh, yeah, right now it's how we are using it with CTS, uh, CTMS. Uh, the trigger for the, the transport is always Jenkins uh, because we want to do a, run a couple of validations on top of it before allowing you to do the transports um, to the next environments. So you run a Jenkins pipeline with a ticket uh, or a transport exactly. ID, and then it, that one would be imported. We we run it with um, a change request on Snow, uh, on ServiceNow, that uh, we will check the state of this uh, change request to see if you are in a proper state. Uh, and you, it, it's like a justification for you to move. OK, so we use this change request. Um, and we also uh, do the CPI lint uh, coverage to see that you are following our guidelines. So we check a couple of stuff before allowing you to move. And uh, on top of that, what is also interesting is that we allow to move multiple CPI packages in, in one go. Uh, so if you have this Jenkins pipeline, you can say, OK, I want you to transport this package, this these and these uh, all uh, at, in, in the same iteration, so in the same execution. And since we are able to interact with CTMS um, via APIs, this is uh, some easy way uh, to do it. Then we also have the rollback transport mechanism, uh, because um, yeah, if you are, um, if we have, uh, if we trigger these uh, transports via Jenkins, we are able also to create backups of the external parameters of the binaries from your target system before you importing there, and uh, that would allow you to later on uh, just roll back, which is basically re-import an old transport again. Um, and applying external parameters that were backed up previously. And 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 yeah, with that, you have a rollback capability that is not out of the box. 
<laughs> and you're talking about uh, externalized parameters. How do you handle those? Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you read the part of the release management, I have a, a funny story on release. Not so funny because we have to, <laughs> to transport like 100 packages. And I was completely lost in so many external parameters that the chai flow can have. So we ended up, I ended up in automating that and uh, creating an extraction for all the external parameters for all the packages in your uh, tenant. And we do this for all the tenants we have for dev tests, uh, pre prod and prod. And yeah, with that, we come into an easier, um, yeah, single file containing all the, the, the parameters and it's easier to maintain and, and to read it than having to go individually to the try flow and check what is uh, the configuration there. Um, with that, so it, this is a CSV file containing all the parameters. Then it's also interesting to to apply those parameters in mass. Uh, so uh, I also developed that um, possibility. Uh, so using the same CSV format, um, we are now able to import in mass and, for instance, change all the URLs in one go in one execution. So it's so it will upload the new configuration and deploy that iFlow. Exactly. Either deploy it or not. This is also an optional step that you can choose when running it. Um, so because sometimes you don't want to deploy, you just want to configure it. Uh, yeah. So we have these possibilities. And in the end, after we configure everything, we deploy all the changed iFlows uh, if if the developer wants to, to do that, yes. OK. Uh, we also got into a discussion on, on code review. And obviously, coming from a, a 10 year or 20 years of experience with SAP process orchestration, no one has <laughs> done much code review of what I have done. And I think, obviously, in, in a PI world, the most thing you have is message mappings, which is difficult to read and understand. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> In the newer world, I guess code review is more important, right? Yeah, this this to be honest, I was kind of surprised to to see <laughs> that you had a different view on it. And 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 since I reflect on it, I think it's kind of our background that is different. So I come more from a development uh, application development world, and you come more from the integration environment, so you have more uh, deeper knowledge on this integration area. And, and but what I see from application development code review is really kind of yeah, uh, no questions that we should do it. So I I was kind of surprised to see that uh, yeah, you don't do it that often. But yeah, I think it's. It's also about the size of the team, uh, as I was mentioning, and the complexity of, of your process. Because um, if we want to apply this governance, you should have this good review. Otherwise, it will slip through your hands and you will lose control of it sooner or later. Because you have a team like uh, uh, 15 or 16 developers, and it's really hard to to keep everything on track and everything in a consistent way. And if you don't do this code review, I, I'm not sure how would, would you do it yeah, to so make it consistent. So obviously, I fully agree, you need to do code review because, and and maybe the, the thing is we did not have, the, there wasn't the tool for it. So it was not really difficult. Yeah. Um, and maybe it is also something about your development process. So if you're getting this new developer on the project, I, I would argue you should not wait until they have created the integration to go and give them the, the review and say, just say, hey, hey no, we don't yeah. want this. But coach them along the way. And then towards the end, exactly. when they have completed the, the story, say, OK, here is, is the code. Okay. There's few minor modifications that you need to do here. That's okay. But it's not like, well, your full architecture is wrong. 
exactly start again <laughs> <laughs> i will not tell you how to fix it just fix it <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> That's a good uh, act. Let me just say uh, as well that the sustained um, DevOps that we have right now and also is good on that area because once the developer joins and start to, I don't know, create some random packages with some random names or started to create uh, default names on the components, it will start to get notified immediately because the pipelines mm. will run. It will create a pipeline for the package he created. It will perform the checks that we have for, for his package. And in the end, if something is wrong with the naming guidelines or with uh, the guidelines we have, it will start immediately to have a notification via email to fix that. So mm. it's also... Uh, contained since the beginning, you know, so it, it's not like we left him uh, do this funny stuff and only in the end we inter intervene. We do it uh, up front at the beginning with this uh, pipeline approach. But the code review, um, yeah, it's more deeper and goes into topics where automation is not really possible, I would say which requires some common sense and uh, yeah, uh, I don't think it's suitable for, for automation. Everything we can do with CPI link for automation, we do it, but then it's also some critical thinking that we need to, to, to put in place. And we have this four eyes principle where another person needs to, to really review what a developer did. Um, and um, so the you same cannot person... move things into production yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that uh, I guess should be the baseline for for uh, all yeah, I think yeah. Um and also we we make sure that the same person that uh, reviews the documentation also reviews uh, the code because this way you don't need to to do knowledge transfer twice to different people. So the person reads the documentation, reviews it, but already get a sense on what is needed for the interface. Um, and can provide some more critical thinking. And this is also something that was evolved over time because in the in the beginning, it was, uh, as I mentioned on the code review um, topic uh, on the blog, it was very informal and it was like, okay, join me and start to, to see my code. This is what I'm doing, I'm doing this and that, and, and, and that's it. So, and I don't see much value on it, to be honest, I, I rather, think of it as an uh, a sync process so you say please review my code when you have the time um but do it on your own with your um, time to reflect and to think about what might be wrong and provide your comments without me interfering in anything basically as a developer you know yeah yeah if yeah, and then I guess it is also about giving the tool, giving you the ability to see, to see what has been changed between different versions. I yeah. guess that's the initial release where you need to say, okay, is this San saying, does this work with our the way we're dealing with this? And then you have the patches that you need to, to check and make sure, okay, it's just this small piece of code or this part of the iFlow that is being changed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is a this is a gate for moving from development to QA, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you, it's your last quality gate before transporting the changes. Uh, from that point forward, we only check the status of the change request. Uh, so to... that is the service now that you the business needs to go in and say, okay, now we have accepted Approval. this change from the QA exactly. system. And then you can now we can project. proceed, and 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 there we also have a pipeline for forwarding, um, which is kind of a facade over the CTMS plus um, the standard functionality, mm -hmm. where we also do some kind of additional checks like okay. this service now uh, checks, and we forward only the latest transport for each uh, package that you want to forward. So it's an additional feature. I, I'm not sure that uh, the standard can do that. So <laughs> one one thing on this cloud transport management, are you looking into what packages and iFlows is a part of those? 
uh, into which package is part of it. Yeah. So okay. we have a, a naming guideline for the transports on uh, CTMS Plus, where we have provide the, the name of the CPI package, the date uh, of um, generation of the MTAR file, uh, and uh, and uh, a description that is freely given by the developer. Um, but using these naming conventions, we are then um, allowed, or it's easier to do this forward and and sorted by um, package and by um, the timestamp uh, of uh, of the transport. So we are able to be basically forward the latest version for all yep. the packages we want. Okay, cool. You also mentioned the testing and <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so you had a few few ideas. Are you consistently? So that was something about creating unit tests for Groovy scripts and uh, some mapping scripts that you also do testing. Is that the level you're testing? And then obviously having the business to test. Yeah, so for uh, unit tests, we started small with um, just uh, unit tests for Groovy for uh, utility functions. Let's say you have a string utils and you want to test something there. If you are doing the trim operation or the the R path or left path correctly, things like that, so easy stuff. Uh, we started with that, but uh, I was kind of surprised to see that there is nothing on cloud integration to again <laughs> to support these unit tests. So um, what we did on Jenkins is this pipeline that runs for every package that is uh, self-generated, this pipeline, also executes unit tests in case the developer puts them into the resources of the of the iFlow. Mm -hmm. So the developer only needs to code their unit tests marked with the JUnit annotations, and they will get uh, automatically executed as part of the daily pipeline. Then we did uh, the same, but this time for XSLT with XPEC um, uh, framework. And uh, yeah, the one that is more complex is for the message mappings. So um, as you mentioned already uh, a few minutes ago, the message mappings is most likely the, the part that can fail most of the times. Uh, and we want to unit test that part. Um, <clears throat> so what we did is, since we had no tool to do that, what we did was really creating a dynamic iFlow with just the message mapping uh, that you want to test. And this so happens you are, all in your the... pipeline. Have a function that takes the message mapping MPL and the... or whatever uh, file M put it into M an map. iFlow. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we 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 retrieve the M map from the package you want to test the method <laughs> mapping together with all the dependencies and scripts, and we generate um, an iFlow dynamically with just that content, the message mapping and um, okay. and the dependencies, as well as a, a step to translate properties uh, because. <laughs> Then we we are deploying this uh, dynamic iFlow and we are calling it. And this way, you have a way to be able to test your message mapping in an isolated way, you know. Yeah, um, and then you just use expect or whatever you have. Or exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for the developer, once again, it's like just coding a unit test, a regular unit test on the unit. Um, there are some expected methods uh, that should uh, be there, like the get expected body, get expected headers, get expected. Uh, uh, I think that's it, basically. Um, and um, yeah, the developer just needs to code that part, and it would be asserted. All this complexity of deploying a dynamic iFlow and so on. This is doesn't need to be known by the developer. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, testing and testing into end iFlows is something a little more complex, but uh, yeah, I guess we, we have it uh, as a part as of well. the tool. So I was talking with a, a client the other day about how you are managing the part about having, a, so you have a s service on iFlow that you're running in production. Mm -hmm. 
there and then you have a an update to this because of a project that is six months long and you need to update the iflow in production how do you have like a mm -hmm. getting around this this flow or how do you actually do that yeah so this is a a, a very interesting question this is a topic still under discussion um fortunately we, we don't have many cases uh on this yet where we have like uh, new announcements uh, at the same time as you had to do bug fixing um but uh, in the end the way i see is either we have dedicated tenants um one for bug fixing and one for announcements where you can have both versions running at the same time on different urls or if we go with a single tenant approach because of costs or any other reason um uh, yeah we will, will only have one version of the iflow mm -hmm. running or we would have to duplicate basically the iflow to have uh, duplicated endpoints <laughs> reachable but this, this is something that i will really yeah um discussed about yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, this, yeah i think it's one of the the more challenging parts of this um cool yeah I think I think there's some room for automation if you go with the approach of a single tenant, uh, but then being able to, yeah, stash your new developments, apply the the proud version, apply the fixes there, move, and then apply the fixes to the your announcement version again. Uh, so restart it again. Uh, so if you go with that approach, I think there's room for automation, but it's not optimal, obviously, because you will only have one version of the iFlow running at the same time. And there's also this yeah. bureaucracy around. So it's it's not really optimal process, I would say. But yeah, what's I, your take on that, by the way? So my take was that they rolled back the development version into the production version made the fixes in it, used the transport of that iFlow to move it into production. And then they rolled back to the yeah. product version, made the, the diff because there may be option to do the, the Groovy code merge if it is Groovy, but I guess in most cases it is something about some iFlow uh, attributes and you cannot really merge those in, in any meaningful way. And then once you have that merge, you now have a new release in, in production and the, the the project version is the same. But I'm not, I also think it's pretty rare that you would have those scenarios. So yes. having some manual way around it and being able to know who is actually working on something, being able to, to say, I am working on this for this project or tag and iFlow or something like that. I think we share the same opinion <laughs> about it. Yeah. Uh, but let me take the chance also to say that once again, I think there's room for improvement on the standard product yeah. because there are no merge capabilities, standard merge capabilities or mass changes of the, the iFlow. So let's say that you want to now have a new content modifier at the beginning of all your iFlows and we now have 400. So how do yeah. you do that yeah. in a mess way? Yeah, I don't know if that is a, a common question that you, you will get because I think adding a content modifier should be somewhat doable. A little complicated, agreed. But will you actually be able to script a search replace for something like that? Uh, or is it just easier to go in and add it? Obviously, for content modifier, it's, it's okay. But if yeah, you need to add just, error just an example. or something like that. Yeah, that was just an example. And, and, and this is something that it was under discussion from the beginning, but also like in a parallel uh, discussion. So it was not always the main focus of our discussion, but it was always there. Yeah. And, um, and the way I see it, or uh, if we could start from the beginning, I would probably try to uh, put some hook methods on very strategic places of the interfaces. So you know process I mean? direct? Exactly. So even SAP has, has this kind of approach with pre-exits and post-exits. I'm not sure you've seen it on some 
standard integration, some of them have this. And I think something similar would need to be applied in our case. So at very strategic places, have the possibility to, to inject, if we want, an additional iFlow, providing extra logic, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah that's a call out, but it just makes things more complicated. Yes, that, that's and, correct. And you get a lot of other dependencies. And then you're if you get into this version project thing, you are... Uh, I would say screw, screwed. <laughs> yeah, but it's like either you do that or you go and manually change the 400 iFlows if you need something critical to put there yeah. that you yeah. have not think initially, you know. And this, yeah. it's only getting worse because <laughs> as the time progresses, you start to create more and more iFlows. So in the end, it's more effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's increasing. So this has, I would imagine, been a quite a learning journey for you, understanding how to create the different pipelines, what can be done, what's going on. If you were to start out, how would you start differently today? Uh, yeah, so uh, if I was starting now, uh, the first thing is I, I should not neglect that uh, this POC can turn into a usable product without you even realizing it. So. At the beginning, it was much of really a POC and the playground. Let's try this and that. And it grew without us really realizing that we should take more measures and take it more seriously, you know, like yeah. now it's kind of a really big uh, stuff that, uh, yeah, we we should change or should have things in a more strategical way if we knew what we know now. Um, so I would say before you start, I think you should uh, think about it seriously, discuss it with your manager, check the set SAP standard delivered options, as well as what is on the market that can fulfill your needs, such as PIGAF or INFOR, I would say, and, and make an informed uh, decision about that. So if you... Um, costs, for instance, of these solutions uh, or a reason to upskill your knowledge or the particularities of your use case can be a driver to justify that you develop internally as we did. But um, you can also go with uh, the solutions that are on the market if they fulfill your needs already. If you go with a custom development approach, I think you should uh, def uh, definitely try to to go with with um, uh, a cloud solution such as Schema on BTP, OpenShift, or other uh, available options on the market, uh, because uh, I think if you go with on-premise as we did, uh, things as updating our software, renewing certificates, uh, Windows updates, and all sort of this stuff needs to be taken into consideration. Um, another thing that I think I would change is the fact that we use Gitty. This can, again, that... What uh, you use? Gitty uh, is a free Git um, ah, okay. software. Um, again, this uh, is because we started as a POC, but if I was starting from scratch now, I would probably involve our um, um, data protection department. Uh, to check if we could store the source code on GitHub on the cloud or even uh, buying uh, licenses for from mm -hmm. premises. So, um, but uh, uh, yeah, we still had time to do a migration to GitHub instead of GT, for, for instance. And uh, if you're starting now, I would say you should go with GitHub because it has the uh, GitHub Actions, Piper, also works in that uh, way so it's i would say it's kind of optimized for github uh, despite it might not be really mandatory but it's optimized for that usage mm -hmm. so i would go with um, with github instead instead and of would, no github instead of uh, git uh, uh, for jenkins part yeah so maybe you can do because, because the if you use GitHub part... Actions and use GitHub and Actions, I guess that would. But a uh, lot of times. Yeah, you can do uh, some replacements of 
Jenkins if you use these GitHub pipelines, but uh, if you are using Docker, uh, if you are using Piper, sorry, you will need to have these shared libraries and, and this is on, on Jenkins. So you still need to have Jenkins okay. somewhere. So Piper uses Jenkins? Jenkins as a base tool, yeah. Okay. Uh, as we did basically. So uh, the difference is that we created our own custom pipelines. Well, they use the standard ones. Uh, they develop their own uh, standard ones. Um, also for portability reasons, I think I would go for Docker instead of doing um, installation directly on uh, on-premise virtual machine. So I think this is really a lesson learned. I think it it would not be that hard that we had to do it with uh, Docker instead uh, since the beginning, and 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 now it's maybe. It's not too late. It's just that we don't have much time to invest on it now, I would say. Mm -hmm. But you still have your user stories. Yes. Uh, so we can do small increments, but we will try to focus more on on the value and bring and then, yeah, to do these kind of technical migrations, let's say that no one sees the value <laughs> besides the developers. <laughs> <you know. laughs> I guess you're talking also about the PI2 cloud integration mi migrations and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah I, I see this more like as technical depth, you know, uh, yeah. that no one from management would easily support that. Uh, you, okay. You're not solving new business goals, just yeah. yes. Uh, okay, no, we are thinking about now is is to implement some kind of um, automatic uh, disablement in mass of iFlows. Uh, so you would want um, if your uh, target uh, is is uh, currently under maintenance, you will uh, like to disable, for instance, an integration. And uh, yeah, uh, we are working on that to disable integrations in mass, let's say. So if you're saying uh, Salesforce, or if you're using the yeah. data is down, or we will yes. disable all the integration. Salesforce yeah. integrations. Yeah, yeah. And push all the errors back to the sending system. To the source, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, nowadays, we are changing a bit the approach uh, because uh, I still think we we need some, we are using some kind of old mechanisms here and there for the integrations, but we are coming more and more into this event-driven architecture. And uh, maybe when we are fully onboarded with that, we really don't need to disable. It will be just staying on a queue and process mm -hmm. it later on. Because it will just fail and it will restart every 10 minutes. Or exactly. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool, uh, Nino. Thanks for uh, for sharing this. Thanks for a great uh, blog series. I've been reading and seeing. Okay, so what is it that you can actually do with uh, these things? And thank thanks for sharing your knowledge here. Yeah, thank you as well, Daniel. Uh, it was an honor to be here and sharing this experience with you and the cool. community. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for for yeah for sharing. I hope you like this uh, video. If you do, please hit the like. Please share it with, with your team members uh, about understanding how you can actually deliver integration in a better way uh, and what you need to get started with. So uh, please, uh, thanks for, 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 for watching here to the end and uh, see you sometime soon. Thank you.